All right. Yeah, I'm gonna, okay. Good evening and welcome to Minimizing AI Risks, an agile ethical legal model for the international and national governance of AI with Wendell Wallach, 2018 visiting Austin J. Fagathy, SJ, Chair at the Santa Clara University Department of Philosophy. My name is Brian Green, and I'm the Director of Technology Ethics at the Markula Center for Applied Ethics here on campus, and I am thrilled to be welcoming you to this event tonight. I would like to mention the co-sponsors of this event, the Santa Clara University Department of Philosophy, the High Tech Law Institute, the Artificial Intelligence Club at Santa Clara Law, and the Markula Center for Applied Ethics. I would also like to invite the audience to fill the evaluation forms that you will find at your seats and invite my students to fill in the sign-in sheet, which is at the back of the room. There will be a time for questions and answers at the end of the talk. Please keep your questions brief so that we can include as many questions as possible. I would now like to introduce to you Shannon Valor, the William J. Rewak SJ Professor in the Department of Philosophy, past president of the Society for Philosophy and Technology, and author of Technology and the Virtues, a Philosophical Guide to a Future Worth Wanting, which is a great book and I highly recommend it. Professor Valor. OK, I'm getting so old that my progressives need progressives, so we're doing this now. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you to the Markula Center uh, for Applied Ethics uh, for organizing, and uh, High Tech Law Institute and AI Club for co-sponsoring this event. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight for a great conversation about minimizing AI risk. As a member of the philosophy faculty at SEU and a close colleague and friend, I am honored to introduce our speaker tonight, Wendell Wallach. He is this year's Distinguished Fagathy Professor in the SCU Department of Philosophy and a world-renowned expert on the subject of the ethics and governance of emerging technologies. In 2009, Wendell Wallach co-authored with Colin Allen the groundbreaking work, Moral Machines, Teaching Robots Right from Wrong, published by Oxford University Press. That book kickstarted one of today's most vital interdisciplinary research programs, the effort to build artificial moral agents that can behave in society in ethically reliable ways. His most recent book is 2015's A Dangerous Master, How to Keep Technology from Slipping Beyond Our Control. It poses broader questions about the responsibility that technology creators and users have for preserving sustainable and safe technological progr progress that goes hand in hand with human progress. Among his many appointments, honors, and affiliations, Wendell Wallach is a consultant, ethicist, and scholar at Yale University's Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics. He is a senior advisor to the Hastings Center and a fellow at the Center for Law, Science, and Innovation at Arizona State University. In addition to his appointment here at SCU, he currently serves as the World Economic Forum's 2016 to 2018 co-chair of its Global Future Council on Technology, Values, and Policy. Wendell Wallach is the only person I know to have received two honors from the World Technology Network, the Award for Ethics in 2014 and the Award for Journalism and Media the following year. He currently leads several important projects in the domain of AI ethics and governance, among them a multi-year project at the Hastings Center funded by the Future of Life Institute that brings together leaders in AI research and other experts focused on the problem of ensuring that tomorrow's intelligent machines are safe, controllable, and demonstrably beneficial to human flourishing. I am thrilled to invite Wendell to the stage and look forward to a great discussion afterward. Please join me in welcoming Wendell Wallach. Well, thank you ever so much. Um, I am truly honored to have been invited to be the faculty um, professor, visiting professor this semester, and I'm having a great time here. And I am doubly honored tonight to also be hosted by the Markula Center, one of the great gems of this university, but not just of this university, I think of the nation and an institution that has long held my admiration. 
Tonight we're going to talk about our ability to shape artificial intelligence and to mitigate its risks and undesirable societal impacts through ethics, engineering, and oversight. If you were to just listen to the techno-optimists, you would think that we are on a highway to heaven on earth and the buses are speeding up at an exponential pace. <laughs> on the other hand, if you just listen to the techno-pessimists, we're clearly going straight to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> but most of us do perceive technology as a source of both promise and productivity, and yet there is considerable disquiet. Disquiet about particular areas of research and disquiet about the overall trajectory of scientific discovery and technological innovation. And you can see that disquiet in the worldwide prohibition on human um, cloning, the use of human growth hormones in sports, the EU debate on genetically modified foods. In the US, we had our debate on the use of embryonic stem cell research. And then there's these ongoing issues, biosecurity, infosecurity, the toxicity of nanoparticles. And just recently, we've had these breakthroughs in artificial intelligence and gene editing often referred to as CRISPR-Cas9 and deep learning that have raised a lot of issues around the safety of biotechnologies and of research in artificial intelligence. There are many characteristics of emerging technologies such as AI. They're developing extremely fast. They're, it's highly uncertain what their benefits, their risks, and their trajectories are. Many concerns fall outside of jurisdictions of traditional regulatory agencies. There's a multitude of application, a multitude of industries, a multitude of concerns, a multitude of potential regulators, a multitude of stakeholders, and a multitude of standards, proposals, and programs. Emerging technologies are reshaping our world in nearly every dimension. Self-driving cars perhaps give us a good metaphor for all this. Technology is moving into the driver's seat as a primary determinant of humanity's destiny. And we may even be in the first stage of inventing the human species as we have known it out of existence. I'm going to begin this talk with a very brief introduction to artificial intelligence, where we are to date. Then I'll talk about some of the key concerns and finish up with some discussion about ethical legal oversight. The term artificial intelligence was born in 1955 in a proposal for a small 1956 gathering at Dartmouth College that was held, um, that was held over the summer. It was attended by a very small but distinguished group of scientists who we now think of as the father of computer science and artificial intelligence. Among them was John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, Claude Shannon, and Herb Simon. They were not only enthusiastic, but optimistic and perhaps a bit naive. They thought it would take 10 years for a computer to beat a world-class chess player. They thought it would take roughly 10 years for us to communicate with a computer in natural language, the way they communicate on Star Trek. And they actually thought that the computer vision, the ability for a computer to identify objects and people and label them, could be performed by one graduate student over the summer. <clears throat> well, it took 41 years before Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov, the then reigning world champion in chess. And though we've made significant advances in computer perception and computer communication, they still far, fall far short of our human abilities. Artificial intelligence has gone through periods that are referred to as summers and winters. Summers when a new trajectory creates great enthusiasm, and winters when there's great disappointment over the limited progress. As most of you know, we are in the midst of the global warming of artificial intelligence. And that's largely because of an approach known as deep learning and a complementary learning approach sometimes referred to as reinforcement learning. But deep learning is the one that gets the most attention. 
Deep learning isn't totally new, but there have been some significant advantage, advances, particularly in the area of computer perception. And some of the some of the newsworthy stories, such as the fact that a computer produced, created by um, DeepMind, a group within Alphabet, within Google, has beat some of the best Go players. And it did so partially in the use of deep learning algorithms. Now, every time there's a breakthrough in computer science, the boogeyman also appears. In this case, the boogeyman is referred to as superintelligence. And superintelligence refers to a time when we have computer systems that are comparable to and then far, um, far outreach human intelligence. The big issue with superintelligence is whether superintelligence, if and when it arrives, will be friendly to humans and human concerns, or whether it will be unfriendly and perhaps even seek our extinction or contribute to our extinction through the pursuit of its own goals. You've all heard the warnings from Elon Musk and Bill Gates and others and Stephen Hawking that want us now to direct some attention to superintelligence and be aware that it could potentially uh, pa cause great risks to humanity. I'm among your friendly skeptics. I'm friendly to the can-do engineering spirit that says remarkable things e exist in our technological future. I'm deeply skeptical that we know enough about intelligence, know enough about how the mind works, know enough about what we can achieve computationally to know whether superintelligence lies on even the distant horizon, let alone the near-term horizon. But when you start talking about 100 years or 200 years, I'm an agnostic. I have no idea what we will achieve because I could never have predicted, no one could have predicted 100 years ago where we are today. <clears throat> In spite of the fact that Sophia, a robot produced by David Hansen at Hansen Labs, was recently granted citizenship in Saudi Arabia, the computers and robots we have today are largely single-purpose machines and quite dumb. I actually was at the event in Riyadh where uh, Sophie was granted her citizenship. She snookered everybody by answering certain questions that, she, that were fed her in advance. And her first comments to this audience, which happened to include a lot of the richest people in the world, in fact, maybe 35 billion of investment capital was represented in that room, and we're talking of, of approximately 120 to 130 billion, trillion, excuse me, not billion, trillion of investment capital that exists in the world. She started her comments by saying, I just love being in a room with rich, smart people. <laughs> no wonder the Saudis gave her citizenship. <laughs> Though, be aware, we're still a few months before women will be free to drive on all Saudi roads. <clears throat> But Sophie talks in non sequiturs if you are able to communicate with her freely, um, just as many of her sisters, such as the Bean of 48. They make crude associations between words, but they don't necessarily understand what is taking place. So while we seem to have conquered machine perception, there are many areas in cognitive development that still lie as thresholds ahead. They include the ability to reason, to have common sense, to engage in planning, to work with analogies, to have full semantic understanding of language. They include empathy, moral decision making, and even consciousness. These all lie on the distant horizon, and some may even represent thresholds that we can't crash with the computational tools that we have or the computational strategies we are building upon today. But when we think about artificial intelligence, there still are these near-term and longer-term governance concerns. They include safety, security, transportation, healthcare, technological unemployment, online behavior. There's issues around data ownership, rights and responsibilities. There's trustworthiness, delegation and dilution of responsibility, transparency and algorithmic biases, privacy, 
human-AI relationships, and of course, the existential risks that might be posed by artificial general intelligence or artificial superintelligence. In addition to superintelligence, the two areas that were listed that perhaps get the most public attention are the weaponization of artificial intelligence and technological unemployment. The weaponization of artificial intelligence includes lethal autonomous weapon systems, cybersecurity and cyber warfare, and what is now referred to as the weaponization of narratives. So when we are talking about the use of social media to manipulate people's attitudes and behavior, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about weaponized narratives. But let's focus a bit on lethal autonomous weapons. Lethal autonomous weapons refer to weapon systems that can both pick their own targets and dispatch or kill with little or no direct human intervention. Is this a good idea or a recipe for future disasters? There's a lot of concern about the capacity to develop such weapon systems, and there's actually an international campaign to ban killer robots, to bring some kind of restrictions on the adoption and deployment of lethal autonomy. I've weighed into these debates, which, by the way, have been taking place at the UN in Geneva under the auspices of what's called the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, where weapons treaties are in introduced, including weapons treaties for cruise missiles, for atomic weaponry, for laser weaponry, and others. <laughs> Those talks have been going on for three years, and they've shifted from expert meetings to meetings that ostensibly will lead toward at least a proposal that countries will be able to vote on. At least we hope that that will be what occurs. But I propose that machines must not make decisions that result in the death of humans. That machines doing so would be mala and se. Now for those of you who don't know this ancient Roman term, it refers to something that is evil in and of itself. Rape is an example of an activity that is mala and se. Machines making life and death decisions aren't mala and say because they're machines, but they are because they're unpredictable, can't be fully controlled, and attribution of responsibility is difficult, if not impossible. And my proposal is that with this higher order moral principle, we can make it absolutely clear what's unacceptable, and then go on to what will be an interminable debate as to when the machines are actually making the life and death decisions and when they are solely functioning as the extension of human will and intention. The problem is today the debate focuses on that ambiguous area and therefore becomes very circular and creates all kinds of space for those who want to obfuscate the conversation and obliterate any attempt that these kinds of weaponry might be banned. But what I'm hopeful is that we will that we will eventually declare that lethal autonomous weapons violate existing international humanitarian law, also known as the law of armed conflict. These are principles that have developed over the last few thousand years and are now codified in the Helsinki Agreements and the Geneva Accords and that make it clear what is and is not acceptable in going to war, in executing war, and in the aftermath of a war. But lethal autonomous weapons are not just about warfare. They have become the symbol for, the, for what is a much larger iceberg that increasingly autonomous robotic systems threaten to undermine the foundational principle that a human agent, either individual or corporate, is responsible and potentially accountable and liable for the harms caused by the deployment of any technology. We as humanity should not want to walk down a road where we have abrogated responsibility for the technologies we deploy. Technological unemployment. Technological unemployment was a, was a concept that, uh, that only a few of us were talking about a few years ago. Suddenly it's on every newspaper and in every magazine out there. 
The term was coined by the economist John Maynard Keynes in 1930, and he coined it to represent the long-standing Luddite fear that each new technology would rob more jobs than it creates. This reoccurs in every generation, and yet for 200 years, no technology has robbed more jobs than it creates, or no technological movement has done so. So each seems to create more jobs than it eliminates. And yet many of us have been proposing that it's different this time. And suddenly those arguments are not being dismissed by backwardly turning economists. These charts, um, they just give you an example of part of what we're dealing with. They're showing developments in productivity and employment and productivity in real wages since the Second World War. And you'll see that the two lines more or less go together, but more recently they have started to diverge. This is referred to by Bryn Yolson and McAvee as the great uncoupling. So for 40 years now, even though there have been productivity gains, anemic, but we've nevertheless had significant productivity gains, real wages for good producing workers have been totally stagnant. And we also see that even though there are productivity gains, employment no longer grows at the same rate as those productivity gains. So it's a big issue and a big debate right now as to what extent cognitive systems, artificial intelligence will contribute to technological unemployment how disruptive it will be, and whether over the long term these technologies may create more jobs than they will eliminate. There's a lot to this conversation, but at least my viewpoint is regardless of whether you think more jobs will be created, these will be truly disruptive technologies in the shorter term. Before I move on, let me say one more thing, though. This is not an artificial intelligence problem per se. This is a problem of political economy. This is a problem that if jobs are going to disappear, then how will people get the goods and services they need to sustain themselves? And will they have meaningful lives if, if work is no longer the source of that meaning? Will we create a world that is meaningful for the future, or are we moving into a world where only those who get the productivity gains are those who prevail? Those are the big concerns. Those are the ones that get a lot of attention. But let's talk a little bit about more immediate concerns that are, are suddenly getting attention, particularly among the computer scientists who realize that, oh my god, they actually do have some ethical issues that they, they thought they could have overlooked. One is transparency. These learning algorithms we have, they aren't the kind of learning that a child engages in as she explores her world. The learning of algorithms and deep learning algorithms in particular is a kind of constrained learning where they look at massive, massive databases looking for salient relationships within those databases and then highlighting those as an output. They're done with a technology known as neural networks, which crudely em emulates what goes on in the human brain. The problem is that between input and output, nobody has any idea what these algorithms are doing. They are not transparent. They are black boxes. That may not matter in many situations, but it is certainly going to matter if a deep learning algorithm is deployed in a context where it could cause a tragedy. At the very least, we would want to have the forensic capability of looking back, understanding why the accident occurred, and taking measures that ensured that that kind of accident wouldn't occur again. But we don't have that transparency. And that raises fundamental questions about when these systems should and should not be deployed, and in the more ambiguous cases when we need to engage in rigorous testing, compliance, and other me measures to ensure their safety. Another big area is algorithmic bias. The use of the word algorithm is probably a little mystifying here because it's not the algorithm where the bias comes in, it's usually the data itself. The old phrase used to be garbage in, garbage out. 
issue of bias is if the learning data, if the data you feed into the system already has racial or gender prejudices, the output's going to have racial or gender prejudices. And do we really have the tools to understand the biases that are implicit in the input data or in the output data so that we at least can take compensating measures? These are issues now for both computer scientists and for legal, and legal theorists and ethicists. How are we going to handle a lack of transparency and algorithmic biases? There's also other issues to do with data. Of course, the ongoing one about, is our data private? But there's also issues of ownership and power. The companies that control information today, like Google and Facebook, are more powerful than the most powerful um, oil companies ever were, or than the big three automobile makers were. Can we be assured that they will use this power responsibility, responsibly. And what responsibility do they have to those of us whose data they have so much influence over? If they don't handle it carefully, it gets hacked, goes out into the public domain, and we never even actually gave them the right to collect this data, let alone put our identity at risk, our assets at risk. In the EU, there is a new bill that demands, and it's going into effect this year, that demands that people have the right to opt out if they don't want the database companies to have access to all this information. Does this make sense? Is it even possible in this world? That same bill also has a provision that all algorithms have to be explainable have to be able to explain how they came up with their decisions. That's not happening. Not as we move into these learning algorithms. And perhaps the standard is too broad that the EU has put in place, but they are at least underscoring that we have some major issues that, that are requiring attention. And they've got an awful lot of research scientists now looking at whether at least they can put in place transparency or how they might manage people who want to opt out because they don't want to lose the European market. So let's turn a little bit more toward governance and how we're going to manage and shape these issues that are arising. There are goals for an ideal governance system. And notice that I'm using the word governance, not just the word government. Because I think we need to go well beyond traditional forms of government regulations and regulatory agencies if we are truly going to shape these technologies in a meaningful way. So the goals for an ideal governance system would include that it be nimble and agile, that it be adaptive, credible, that it function as a good faith broker, that it's participatory, allowing for multi-stakeholder input, that it's comprehensive, and that it is coordinated. That's a pretty long way from what we have from, for government today. And not only that, we have a fundamental mismatch between the demands of the emerging technologies and the kind of existing governmental oversight. This mismatch is largely because of the speed of scientific discovery and technological innovation. There's this growing gap between the discovery and deployment of technology and their oversight through legal ethical means. This gap is sometimes referred to as the pacing problem. Two additional limitations of what is often referred to as hard law regulation for AI. Many of the risks or concerns are really outside of traditional agencies' jurisdiction. Which of our federal government's agency is going to deal with technological unemployment, existential risks, algorithmic biases? Furthermore, the way we handle regulations today and have over the past decades is largely piecemeal. We deploy technologies, wait for a problem to arise, and then when it does arise, we try and address it one piece at a time. And that has led to a pretty gangling and incoherent 
governmental system, where oftentimes the same technology is split up among many agencies for different reasons. In the case of AI, and really all the emerging technologies, but particularly AI because of the way in which it's going to touch so many facets of our lives, it would be beneficial to have a more holistic approach to its oversight. A holistic approach that integrates all the applications, risks, and stakeholders, and thinks through the societal impact of these technologies as we shape what kind of world we really want to be creating. Gary Marchant and I, Gary is the director of the Center for Law and Innovation at the Sandra Day O'Connor uh, School of Law at Arizona State University. He and I were sitting down one day lamenting how incoherent our ability to govern emerging technologies has been. And at one point, we just decided to change the conversation 180 degrees. We said, rather than complain, if we had our druthers, what would we put in place? And we came up with what we at that time referred to as governance coordinating committees. This would be a new governance body that would function as an issues manager, kind of an orchestra conductor, that would coordinate the activities of the many stakeholders, underscore best practices, and engage in comprehensive monitoring of the developments in a field. Not only the benefits, but particularly flagging the issues and gaps. And if those issues and gaps were not being addressed by industry or others, then this body would try and find solutions within a robust set of available mechanisms. Furthermore, it would be mandated to avoid regulation wherever possible. One of the difficulties of regulation is you put it in place and technology a few years later just makes it absolutely obsolete, but the regulations never go away. So what is this robust set of mechanisms? Well, first of all, you could look at ethics and engineering. Here we are in California, the land of techno-solutionists and libertarians who don't want any government anyways. And they have all kinds of techno-solutionists um, ideas for how we can mitigate any problem. Of course, many of them are, are dependent upon technology that's not feasible, at least given our understanding today. So we should look for those technological solutions that are feasible. One of the nice things that's happened with this concern around deep learning and uh, superintelligence is that a new trajectory in artificial intelligence has come about. Up to now, artificial intelligence research has largely been about getting the systems to function as the researchers want them to function. But the fear is, what happens in the pursuit of their function if they just do dangerous or unsafe things? So this new trajectory is called AI safety. And within it, there's this subfield, which is sometimes referred to as machine morality, machine ethics, or value alignment. Shannon was kind enough to mention uh, um, Colin Allen in my book, which is now 10 years old, but suddenly has become contemporary, which outlined this new field of inquiry, which is largely about imbuing sensitivity to ethical and legal considerations in the machines themselves in the hopes that we can also get them to factor those considerations into their choices and actions. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Another way we can, we can proceed is value-added design, which is largely about designing privacy, responsibility, and transparency into the technologies themselves. We can engage in social engineering. We can demand more responsibility from corporations. In fact, we have a unique opportunity here because the corporations do understand that there is an AI like, excuse me, a GMO like elephant that's about ready to pounce out of the AI closet. The demand for genetically modified foods is next to nothing in Europe, in Africa, in Canada. 
The AI industry does not want to see the public turn against their technologies. So they are ready to be responsible. Hopefully not just create the image of responsibility, but actually put in place new mechanisms. And these could include within the corporations, AI technical review boards and AI ethics officers able to bring to the attention of corporate uh, uh, of the corporate executive committee and their board of directors issues with the technologies being developed. But the focus in the mechanisms that we need is sometimes referred to as soft law or soft governance. For those of you for whom this is a totally new term, it refers to standards, industry practices, laboratory practices and procedures, insurance policies, a whole plethora of mechanisms that we already have for technologies but are not given adequate attention. And last but not least, there is hard law, regulation and regulatory agencies, treaties and verification regimes. But let me say a little bit more about soft law and soft governance. It has three intrinsic limitations. One is there's no assurance that anyone will participate or comply with the standards. Furthermore, any group can create its own standards. You might be hearing about the AI standards from IEEE or the Asilomar principles. All kinds of groups now are putting forward principles and standards they'd like to be adopted. But many of these overlap, sometimes they're redundant, sometimes they're in conflict with each other. And finally, the public doesn't have full confidence in soft law, or at least not the kinds of confidence that we put in traditional government legislation. So in short, soft law has the benefit of being very agile. If, if an old standard no longer applies, you just throw it out. But it is weak in our ability to enforce it. Nevertheless, there are some mechanisms for enforcing certain soft law standards, but in addition to those, we propose a totally new role for government. And that is, if government comes to understand that it cannot keep pace with the, with the onslaught of new technologies, it moves into the role of not being the creator of all new laws and regulations. Instead, it moves toward putting mechanisms in place to back the enforcement of the widely accepted standards, to ensure that those who violate those standards in a way that are harmful to people, animals, and institutions, that there is a means to prosecute them. There's already precedence for this kind of enforcement. Now, any new, any new institution will have implementation challenges. This new body, where's it going to get its authority, its legitimacy? Will it have adequate influence? How will the members and administrators be chosen? How will it establish credibility? Is it going to be governmental or private or some combination of the two? Who's going to fund a governance coordinating committee? To whom will it be accountable? All of these implementation challenges probably have made some of you feel that this proposal is just too complicated. And perhaps even a few of you think it's hopelessly naive. And no doubt one, of you think, one or two of you think it's both complicated and naive. <laughs> Nevertheless, Something like this is needed, and these are just preliminary ideas to try and work toward putting some effective mechanisms in place. Gary and I propose pilot projects in artificial intelligence and robotics and synthetic biology. We propose projects for those two areas both because it's become very pressing with recent breakthroughs whether we can manage these technologies, but also up to now they're relatively unencumbered with existing laws and regulations. But more recently we've also recognized that it's not enough to put a, glo a governance coordinating committee in America or hope that Europe and other countries will follow suit. In fact, there's a great likelihood 
that the Arab world, that the Russians, that the Chinese aren't going to follow suit with anything that starts in America. And therefore, recently, we propose that this begin as an international project with complementary national and regional bodies that hopefully will, will arise at the same time or follow suit. And this has been formulated in a new project that we call BGI for AI. You can go um, to that website, bgi4ai.org, for more details. And it basically refers to building agile and comprehensive global infrastructure for the oversight of AI and robotics. If we're going to have an international project, it's important that it, it support and cooperate with other groups, not be a competitor. There are so many international organizations, industry-promoted consortiums, and research centers jumping into this space, including the Markula Center. And each of them is sensitive to comp competition and sensitive to the usurp usurpation of their authority. But it's not enough to just put in place a process as I have outlined here. We need real outcomes. And therefore, as a first action, we proposed a Global Governance Congress and, and have been talking with the UAE, with uh, Singapore, with Hong Kong, whether they might serve as hosts for this first Congress, whose agenda we believe would be to put in place standards for algorithmic bias and for transparency. And what I mean by standards there, guidelines for what systems it doesn't really matter whether they are biased or transparent, or at least doesn't matter from a governance or legal perspective, what systems would be so dangerous that they should never be deployed if they have these characteristics, and what kind of compliance and testing standards we should put in place for those systems that fall in that middle ground. And this Congress might also look at issues of data integrity and ownership. Finally, the Congress would begin to lay the foundation for BGI for AI infrastructure, to make decisions about whether it should be within an international body such as the UN, within national governments, or whether it should be a standalone non-governmental organization. Emerging technologies are radically restructuring all of our life. But if technology development is accelerating as it appears to be, then the need for foresight and planning is truly pressing. Thank you ever so much. That's a formal presentation. We have time for some questions, and uh, uh, I think this was scheduled until 8 o'clock, but I'm going to stay here with questions for quite a while, so all of you should feel free to leave as you need to. And I see some, some of our audience is already on their way to study for tomorrow's classes. <laughs> so who's got a question? Who's got a concern that they'd like to bring up? Yes, ma'am. First of all, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed learning more about this. Um, and then my question would be, if Saudi Arabia's action can be taken as a precedent for other countries in granting citizenship to machines, how does the concept of citizenship refrain from eroding, especially when things like civil liberties, like innocence until proving guilty, uh, privacy, or free speech would come along with it? Let's be clear. This was a publicity stunt. <laughs> a publicity stunt by both Hanson Robotics and by Saudi Arabia. And if other countries are foolish enough to do the same, um, then they don't deserve to, to have your vote or your support. But the questions you asked are larger questions, ones that have come up within philosophy and law and ethics, which is, what kinds of responsibilities might be delegated to systems as they evolve? And in thinking through that, what do we understand about human agency? 
both human legal agency and human agency in terms of our capacity for freedom. These are fascinating subjects. They're largely futuristic, but even thinking through these more futuristic concerns has been helpful for people in the law. For example, now in the law we're also looking at whether certain kinds of agency or rights should be granted to great apes or even other creatures. So between that conversation and the more futuristic conversation about what capabilities there what capabilities machines should have before they might be granted agency, that's helping us illuminate the world we're moving through. But God forbid if we see a lot of countries giving basically dumb machines, not even really smart machines, citizenship. Yes, sir. about the automatic lethal weapons. What exactly is the border between lethal and not lethal? For example, if I have a machine that shoots dart with darts with a narcotic in it, um, and they kill one out of 10,000 people, is that still a lethal weapon or not? Because I think non-lethal weapons are the actually holy grail of warfare, because with that I can have a war without any casualties, which makes it much easier, uh, which is not a good thing, but just which makes it much easier to make a war. So where is the border between lethal and not lethal? There is no clear border. And a lot of the debate is how we make these areas of discrimination. It's also what's autonomous and what is not autonomous. And it's not just an issue around lethal. It's just, it's just as much an issue around all the people who are maimed by warfare, all the people who are injured in other, way, other areas. So we can debate this till hell freezes over by trying to get clear-cut lines. And that's largely where the conversation is right now. It's probably not going to get effectively resolved, largely because many of the parties don't want to resolve this. They want to have the right to deploy this kind of weaponry. My hope is, though, that we as a public will say that that's not acceptable for us. It's important to keep in mind that lethal autonomous weapons are not a weapon system. They are a feature set that can be added to any weapon system. So we aren't talking about drones out there with facial recognition software that wait for a terrorist to appear and then take them out, that maybe sit you know, over a village for days and weeks on end just waiting for the person to appear that they want to kill. We're talking about weapon systems that could deploy high-powered munitions, even nuclear weapons. So the question is, how are we going to restrain the dilution of human responsibility, the dilution of meaningful human control? It's not going to be that we're going to get a clear-cut line, but what we might get is high-order demands for what kind of meaningful human control we put in place. The reason I offered that high order moral principle is because I want us to get away from believing that establishing some clear cut line is the way forward. Instead, we need to establish clarity about what is absolutely unacceptable, and then there are various means to look at how we're going to deal with the more ambiguous cases. If this is a subject that interests any of you, uh, last year I had an article in uh, the journal of, of the ACM and uh, that outlined ways forward how we can deal in light of these issues and ambiguities that come up when we talk about lethal autonomous weapons. I think we've got oh, a we question here. here and, oh, okay, you've got somebody. <laughs> we'll go there and then we'll go here. Yes. No, you can just go without a mic. Can you speak up? Yeah. Yeah, so thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is, like, what are some of these higher order moral principles you're talking about? It seems like there's difficulties, one, in getting everyone to agree on what ethics are, like what is moral and what is not. And two, it seems like we still have difficulties getting humans to act consistently ethically. So it seems like those. But these aren't humans. These are machines that we're building. We're programming them. We're telling them what to do. 
And furthermore, we get too carried away with the differences humans have on ethics. Yes, there are areas where we prioritize values differently and those prioritizations lead to different opinions on whether a fetus is, a, is human or not, whether it's alive and whether it should have rights. But there's broad consensus on a vast array of ethical concerns. Values per pervade everything. And if we didn't have consensus, we wouldn't even have the degree of cooperation we, we have today. Most of you drive on a particular side of the highway. You, you keep your eyes open for other people and try not to bump into them. And I could go on and on and on. So I'm arguing there's more consensus than, than we admit. And yes, there are these torturous issues. And there are some real differences. And there's differences in the emphasis of how we prioritize different principles. But I'm less concerned with that than I am with our failure to do what we can do because we are constantly putting forward these arguments about how people don't agree. Because if that's what we do, we have no way of restraining those who don't even want to cooperate in the first place, those who just want to exploit us, the bad actors, those who are intent on being destructive. So I think we sometimes get caught up in this mnemonic about how people don't agree. And particularly at this moment in history, where disagreement seems to serve the political ends of some individuals, we are failing to recognize the areas where we do have some consensus. So let's build on that first, and then we can go on to deal with the issues that are still difficult to resolve. Professor Wallach, this is a question in the same vein. Uh, if not com the common principles that we're going to employ in this governance scheme, who are the people who are going to be selected for this Congress uh, and for the processes of developing these standards? Uh, if it's you and me, I have full confidence this is going to be a wonderful system. <laughs> but I'm not sure who the Chinese are going to send or the Russians or whomever uh, to this conference. So well, how, how do we control that? Or what, what's, the, what's your response to that concern? Well, if they send Vladimir Putin or his clone, we're in real trouble. <laughs> no, I mean, these are really well taken points. And I'm not sure how effectively we will be able to move forward. At the moment, I'm just trying to get some first actions on on such a Congress, and then we'll have to work through who's a delegate and who isn't, and whether decisions are made by consensus or whether you need some absolute majority. It's obviously important that you have major players, including both industries and countries, buying in. So could this all fail? Certainly. You know? And if it gets too much power, could the power players try and subvert it? For their, own, um, for their own gains, certainly. But I look at it the other way around. If we don't try, what are we left with? So I'm making a good faith effort. I'm hoping we can get something in place that can function as, as a way of assuring, first of all, the public that these technologies are being developed responsibly and secondly, to put in comprehensive oversight. I actually believe that most of the parties would agree that the responsible development of this technology is important, and the getting the public to buy in is important. And right now, there's a great deal of fear that we aren't going to get that buy-in. So at least that might get us through some of the first steps. But could this fail? Easily. You know. But that, again, I don't think that should stop me or anyone else from trying. My, con my biggest fear is that we won't get enough support to move quickly, and it will be a little too late. Yes. Great. Um, I don't have to worry about who to call. <laughs> Wonderful. Sorry. So um, 
I, I think this follows, and, and I, I apologize that we keep bringing up sort of points of contention or places where no, we're no, not no, sure no, this no, will no, work. No, that's but that's exactly um, where we should be focused. You mentioned the need for collaboration and cooperation, and so much of the development of technology seems to be based on competition. And all these technology companies and researchers are in competition with each other. So how do you, how do you build that spirit? How do you get this kind of inherent competitiveness and wanting to be first to market or to have the you know, best product to uh, turn into the kind of spirit of collaboration that it would be required for this kind of governance? Well, they do want to be first to market, but they also don't want their market destroyed. So it's playing with that tension. Uh, recently, the leading AI companies put in place a partnership on artificial intelligence. And they not only put this in place, but they invited those of us from, uh, from um, non-governmental organizations. Uh, Brian Green represents the Marcula Center at the Partnership in Artificial Intelligence. Um, I believe they put it in place because their intention was to create the image that they will be responsible. My concern is that they only wanted the image of appearing to be responsible and won't actually be responsible. But I'm also hoping that some of us, Brian and myself, for example, will hold their feet to the fire because all of the NGOs who have now joined the partnership in AI are looking with great suspicion on why this organization was created and whether it can be effective or not. So I think that's an example of their recognition that there's a problem and it's a challenge. And if they want to develop this technology and get the rewards and riches they expect from it, they need to demonstrate a high degree of responsibility without obliterating their ability to be competitive. But there's plenty of scope for being competitive in the areas that are beneficial. The estimates are that we will see remarkable riches from artificial intelligence. I mean, we're talking about trillions of dollars over the next decades. So there's probably enough reward money to go around presuming we don't kill the goose with the golden egg. Most of the developers understand that. Where it gets problematic is when you're talking about the political actors and what their intentions are and how they might want to use this technology for warfare. We are now witnessing how our whole political system has been upset by weaponized narr narratives, by cyber warfare. Vladimir Putin does not have the economic might to compete with China or America in this space. But he does have the power to create a great deal of mischief. And he seems to be satisfied with doing that. So if he can destabilize other countries, then perhaps that gives him an edge. So that's what we're witnessing today. And it's not just with Putin. We do the same thing with other countries. The difference is only that Vladimir Putin happened to have gotten caught in one of the most crucial of American elections, or at least the most recent one. But it's not like we don't engage in cyber warfare also. So the dangers are really on that political front and how the political leaders exploit these technologies for their own purposes. But I actually believe industry can be enlisted in more cooperative efforts. And if we enlist Baidu, and if we enlist Alibaba, the two leading AI research firms in China, and if we enlist the UAE and other bodies in, who are in Saudi Arabia that are investing a great deal of resources in being leaders in this space and improving the lives of their citizens with artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies, I think we have a pretty good opportunity to, to create some cooperation and underscore where there is misuse of the technology. There's somebody else back here? Mm -hmm.
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm wondering, sitting at the back here, and wondering how um, the whole reality of the digital divide that you know uh, you talk about acceleration. You know these technologies are much more available and accessible and working here as compared to Malawi. We uh, spoke yeah. today. Uh, about Malawi and the I I issues sure. of concern there. So how in our figuring out the ethical ramifications of this, do we factor the big divide that empowers mainly the global north mm -hmm. uh, while leaving much of the global south behind? Who will be at the table as we negotiate the way forward? And will they have the same kind of cloud that the Saudis have? Would Malawi have the same sure. kind of input? This is a great question and something that I and others care passionately about and there's many pieces to it and there are many things going on. One of the things that I think a global governance body can do is when Malawi, for example, thinks, well, what standards should we put in place and do we really even have the resources to think it through? Perhaps they can come to the, the global infrastructure process project and say, well, what are the best practices that have come to fore, and can you help us shape those for our society, given our society's values? So that's a first step. A second step is, how can we transport some of these technologies so they really are transformative for societies that have often been left behind? There's a lot of areas where that comes up, and one is if we're really going to move forward on health care, then how do we distribute the, the, the advantages in health care so they're available to all the people of the world? But for example, there's a, a project in, um, oh, I'm trying to remember which country it is now, um, one of the African countries to make a medium-sized city the pilot project for a smart city and to get buy-in from many of the other African cities. So that could actually be an opportunity to allow some of the African countries to jump over what has taken place in the more developed or developing world and take part or have some of the advantages of these technologies very quickly. And this is particularly attractive to some of the, the IT corporations and others because they think that that's a possibility to open up vast new markets. But they're going to have to have it demonstrated that there's some kind of payback if these investments are made. So there's a lot of attention going to this. At the ITU, in, which is a, a body within the UN last year, we had a conference which was the AI for Good Global Summit. And that was people coming together to think through exactly these kind of challenges. And there will be a second, uh, second such meeting this coming year. So a lot of thought is going into how these technologies might be used to kickstart other societies. Now that said, we have a lot of countries in the world that are just dysfunctional, that don't even have functional governments. We aren't going to be able to solve the political problems with the technologies. But there certainly are societies that are well positioned to take advantage of these new technologies. Um, yes, thank you for your courage to propose um, an idea. It's wonderful to have something to chew on. In your, I have a, I suppose, a an amendment to your proposal, um, or it's a question. Um, it's the intersection between uh, intellectual capital, the patent system, um, and the production of new knowledge where technology actually comes from. Uh, isn't there uh, a potential model of returning a 17, 20 year um, monopoly for the revelation of your uh, invention as a way of progressing, as a way of 
promoting transparency, have you in your proposal considered the intersection with the patent system? I personally haven't, and perhaps you're the person we need to, uh, <laughs> to work on that. I mean, this governance challenge is truly vast. And there are so many pieces to it. And there are people all over the world who have some of the expertise that are needed. The difficulty is whether we can put the institutions together that can bring together that multi-stakeholder, multi-expertise input and work through the challenges together. And that's more of what I'm looking for than I necessarily know what the answers to all the questions or even what all the mechanisms are that we can put in place. There are these expertise. Unfortunately, we live in a siloed world. We go to colleges and universities that tend to silo knowledge and reward people for their specialized expertise. When what we really need is transdisciplinary thinking, we need people working together. We need a reward structure that rewards young people for becoming transdisciplinary scholars and not just specialists. We don't have that. We don't have the mechanisms to take advantage of that. And an awful lot of what I've been engaged in over the last few years is silo busting. I've been trying to bring together the AI researchers with the social scientists and the philosophers and others so that they can all begin to think a little bit more broadly and work together at the challenges at hand. It's not easy. But it's got to be done. We are creating a new world out there, and it's going to be those of you in this audience who are going to make that deci those decisions, and you're going to make a decisions about what kind of world we should be creating. You may not always have the power, just as I don't necessarily have the power to enact some of the ideas I'm putting forward, but that doesn't alter the, the critical necessity of trying to do so. And it goes way beyond the technologies themselves. The technologies are just an expression of the fact that the social contract which has vivified the Enlightenment era of the last 300 years does not seem to be working so well in the present political context, in the present social context, under the stress that these technologies are bringing upon it. So can we forge a new social contract? The social contract in this case being the agreement we have among ourselves that allows people to buy in and cooperate with each other. Increasing numbers of people don't seem to want to buy in. And their fears and concerns get exploited by politicians. So we are in the midst of a major historical challenge, a major historical transition, sometimes referred to as the fourth industrial revolution. But it's also <laughs> perhaps a new political revolution. For, and we may need to go beyond Enlightenment 1.0 and come up with a new, a new social contract that reinforces a spirit of cooperation among humanity. Either that, or we're going to live in a world even more conflicted than the one we have seen over the last few decades. So I don't mean to end on that pessimistic note, because my intention is really to help seed the beginnings of a vision that empower you to work toward means of transforming the world we're moving through. It's always been an uncertain world. It's always been a world where we can't know the results of our actions and we can't always control them. I happen to think that that's the role of ethics. Ethics is not about an algorithm for what's right and wrong. It's about a set of tools that help us move through the uncertainties of life. Move through them in a way where we sort of know where balance lies, where we sort of know where the mean lies, where we sort of know where cooperation lies. None of us have the answers. None of us can do this alone. But if we can revivify that spirit of cooperation, perhaps we can find a way of navigating the challenges of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So thank you very much.